Morning News. This is Dave Ross with Colleen O'Brien. Let's talk some real estate here with Matthew Gardner, Chief Economist for Windermere Real Estate. And it looks like um, the new figures show the housing market uh, came roaring back after the snow. Huh? It did. I mean, quite a significant pop. I mean, I started looking at uh, the number of sales, number of transactions between February and March. And they jumped by, what, over 60% in King County, uh, more than that in Snohomish, uh, about just shy of that in Kitsap. So, and price rising, I think there's an interesting question as to why did this happen. And essentially, I think a lot of sales were held over because mm-hmm. we all remember Snowmageddon. Uh, and I think a lot of the market essentially stopped for a period of time. That then came rushing back. But also, as importantly, uh, a, or was a significant drop in mortgage rates. We saw them drop by almost half a percent. Massive, massive move. So I think a lot of people that were on the fences, so obviously jumped off them. Uh, and we're actually going to see a real spring market, which is interesting because we did not see that last year. So it looks healthy according to the numbers, but I have to bounce this off you because we've had a big discussion ever since the, the Como television report called Seattle is Dying, whether this is a healthy community worth investing in or whether our government leaders have just um, written off the problems and we're going to have to live with them. I mean, that is that's that is the seems to be the overriding question in people's minds. So first of all, what's your take on that whole Seattle is dying meme? Uh, we have significant problems. There's no question about it. Uh, and I think there's, there's several things you need to look at. And a good example of this is, I mean, I fly a lot and I come back into SeaTac Airport. And what do I see? Baggage claim. Uh, a bunch of people there saying, can you give money for the homeless? Mm-hmm. Now, I mean, I, I live here, so I kind of get it, but I think it's an interesting uh, facet to see that occurring. Imagine you're a traveler coming here. Is that really the first thing you want to see? Yeah. Do we have problems? Yes, we do. Uh, and I think, yes, uh, has the uh, city council dropped the ball? No question about it. I, I think we need to spend a lot more effort, a lot more energy on trying to address this. It is not unique, however, to Seattle. We see it in Portland. We see it very much so in San Francisco. So it's endemic uh, in a lot of markets up and down the West Coast. Comfortable place for for people to be. If they're not having anyone pushing back on them, then they're going to stay. So uh, can that have a a significant effect on the housing market? Well, I think if you look, you got to look at two markets. Certainly the downtown market, sure, uh, I think it can. However, in terms of uh, the city as a whole or the region, probably I think the effects are, are less consequential when it comes to housing prices. So I don't expect to see that having a major impact, but it, it is something that's hanging out there which needs to be addressed, yeah. and it is clearly not happening. Another controversy, perennial controversy, is sound transit. Has it been worth the money? And we were talking about you know, Amazon's decision to move into Bellevue, which I think come up in our discussions before. And uh, John Shelmanak, uh, actually former Cairo employee, now the mayor of Bellevue, pointed out that uh, – a lot of development on the east side is being driven by that light rail line now. Do you agree with that? Oh, absolutely, I do. If you think about it, well, once the line gets opened, depending on when you believe that's going to be, they're still saying 2024. Uh, imagine a situation whereby you, if you are, let's say, an employee at Amazon, you can be in your office in Seattle, and 12 minutes later, you could be at your office in Bellevue. That is very, very significant. So is it driving that? Very much so. And I think... Bellevue continues, and it's been that way, I would argue, since the late 1990s, emerging as uh, an independent city, uh, yeah. one that doesn't uh, necessarily run to the tune of Seattle. That happened when Symmetra Financial opened up their global headquarters in, I believe, 99. Is it growing? Yeah. Is it autonomous? Absolutely. Has it also got the space to develop? More so than Seattle, very much so. Right. So I think when you see uh, Amazon expanding there, and I think the expansion there, in my personal opinion, they're not going to replace the Long Island Sound facility, which they pulled back from. They're just going to spread those people out into Seattle, Bellevue, uh, or into Austin and into other markets, San Francisco, I would imagine, as well. So, yeah, I mean, Bellevue is going to certainly benefit, I would argue, dramatically from light rail when it occurs. Okay. So looking for bargains, uh, somebody who's looking to buy a house and has been discouraged by uh, all this news of uh, of the market coming roaring back and prices going up, there are still some undiscovered places or under underappreciated places. Perhaps. Yeah, I, I think not undiscovered, but certainly underappreciated. Yeah. I think there's two ways I would look at this. One, we already talked about mass transit, light rail. I am still remarkably excited about markets which are proximate to future light rail stations. Uh, an example is with Roosevelt University District, Northgate. Those are, are markets which, again, historically, relatively speaking, cheap, 
However, they are going to ben- be benefiting from light rail as of 2021, not that far away. No. And so I think that we know we're not going to build any more roads. We need to move people around. I, I would be, without a doubt, looking at these markets and even further down the road, uh, North Seattle, Shoreline, Mount Lake Terrace. The light rail not scheduled to be there until about three years later, about 2024. But again, I, I, we're certainly already seeing some investors start to look around those markets to start picking off some houses which they believe longer term are going to see more significant upside in terms of price than many others. I look at what happens in other areas of the country. We have some relatives living in Washington, D.C., for example, where that light rail system has created some uh, really remarkable suburbs that have uh, a mix of apartment buildings and single-family homes, but you hop on a train, and in a half hour, you're in Washington, D.C., and it's, a, and it's a very appealing lifestyle to a lot of people. Oh, very much so. And we, uh, as a nation, we're comfortable commuting up to 35 minutes each way. Uh, that's the level which we've decided. That's, that's that what we're, studies that, tell you? Correct. That we're okay. Yeah, up 30, 35 minutes is the golden. But, but it has to be 35 minutes, David. It can't yeah. be 20 minutes one day and an hour and a half the next. Yeah, right. Uh, and clearly, mass transit has, well, depending on the form of it, has that capacity. So uh, I think, yeah, uh, we will create these emerging neighborhoods, I would also argue to a degree, we need to look at density and whether the rezoning that's being talked about now is sufficient enough to meet that demand. I mean, you could argue that where some markets will say, okay, you can build up to 65 feet, well, perhaps you should be able to build up to 90 feet. Perhaps we can actually add more density than is currently being suggested. But it's not just areas around uh, future mass transit options, which I think are important as well. There are other ones. I mean, go back. It was several years ago, for example, let's look at Columbia City. Georgetown, historically very underappreciated. Certainly, that is clearly not the case today. No. They have already emerged. And so I think there's some other ones which I would look at as well, uh, which would be in Burien, uh, Beacon Hill, Allentown. I would also argue White Center, the south of Delridge uh, in West Seattle, as areas, again, which, relatively speaking, are cheap. Mm-hmm. Sales prices are still below $500,000. Mm-hmm. Certainly not cheap, but everything is relative. And I think those are areas, again, it's, it's these first ex-urban markets, first rings around uh, our cities, they're the ones that I think are going to benefit in the long run, more so uh, than in further suburban Sammamish Plateau, Issaquah, these kinds of areas. So the prosperity, because I know Burien has you know, sort of a mixed reputation, same thing with White Center. You think the prosperity trend is strong enough to really reach into those areas as well? Huh? I think it can be. But again, you've got to look at it not on a, uh, I can buy a house now and it's going to double in value in 18 months. Yeah. No. I mean, you should always be taking the longer view. Uh, your house is your home first and an asset second. I, I've always said that. But yeah, I, mean, I really think that uh, we've seen it before. As I mentioned in Columbia City, not necessarily several years ago, a, a great place to be. Now, you're seeing townhomes there trading in the uh, high $800,000 price range. Yeah. But again, also proximity to mass transit, proximity to downtown. So yeah, I, I would argue over time, we'll see this. We'll see capital expenditures. We'll see retail start moving in there which essentially always follows population. Start seeing some good, re- always watch restaurants. You start seeing good restaurants open, always a very good sign. That's the signal. Yes, it is. <laughs> there, there are some great restaurants in Columbia City. Oh, that's some of the best <laughs> ones I've eaten in the last year, both down there, yes. Matthew Gardner, Chief Economist for Windermere. Matthew, thank you.